Waiting for concrete to cure is so boring. Which is why I thought we'd give hot and sexy hot plates some lovin' and make ourselves some transparent wood. That's right, you heard me, transparent wood. Not quite as cool as Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. Pretty damn close. The methodology for this is gonna come from this paper, which is a few years old now, 2016, I think. Highly anisotropic, highly transparent wood composites. No, that should just send a chill up your spine. Zoo et al. Link for abstract down below. I heard a little blurb on BBC World Service the other day, and that's what reminded me of this. And then when I looked at the paper, lo and behold, one of the ingredients is that crazy solution I made up to make the densified wood. It's the same stuff because it relies on the same idea of getting rid of the lignins in the wood. If you haven't seen that video, it's a couple back. So since I've got a jug of this stuff already, I thought, why the hell not? Now one thing I don't have is a 30% hydrogen peroxide solution. 3% hydrogen peroxide? That I have. Now our science friends here used that 30% solution to make up a 2.5 molar solution of hydrogen peroxide. So do you suppose that's what we've got here? I have no idea. We could go to the internet and look up what the molarity of a 3% solution of hydrogen peroxide is, but if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, that place is full of lies. Let's figure it out ourselves. Grab a juice box and I'll meet you over in Chemistry Corner. If you're going to do any dabbling in the chemical dark arts, either in your kitchen or basement or that place you live under the stairs, you're going to have to come to grips with a concept called molarity. The units of molarity are moles per liter, which won't help you a damn bit if you don't know what a mole is. It's not one of these and it ain't one of these either. A mole is similar to a couple or a dozen. It tells you how many of something there is. Where a dozen tells you there's 12, a mole tells you there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23 things. Now that seems like a pretty random number, except that it's not. When you consider that 12 grams of carbon will contain exactly 6.02 blah 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 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon. Now this is where you need to whip out your pocket periodic table because every element in the periodic table will have an atomic mass associated with it. All that number tells you is if you had one mole of that stuff, how much would it weigh? If you were holding in your hand 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of cobalt, it would weigh exactly 58.93319 grams. The units for atomic mass are grams per mole and the units for molarity are moles per liter. This should give you some idea where we're going here. So let's say you came across a protocol that required you to make a two molar solution of sodium chloride. That means you want two moles of salt in one liter of water. So now you should be asking yourself how many grams of sodium chloride are there in two moles? The first thing you need to do is find out what the molecular weight of sodium chloride is and you can do that by just adding the atomic masses of each of the elements. So in this case we have sodium at 23 grams per mole about and chlorine at 35.5 grams per mole for a total of 58.5 grams per mole. So one more time, if you had one mole of sodium chloride in your hot little hand, it would weigh exactly 58.5 grams. But we need two moles of the stuff for our two molar sodium chloride solution, which means we'd need twice as much or 117 grams of sodium chloride. So to make that solution, you would weigh out 117 grams of salt and then you would dissolve that to a total volume of one liter. And that would be exactly two molar. Now I know you're thinking, hey dumbass, that hydrogen peroxide solution's already in water. What are we gonna do now? Don't worry, I got a plan. Those bottles of hydrogen peroxide are 3%, which means there is three grams of hydrogen peroxide in 100 mils of water. Or to put it another way, there are 30 grams of hydrogen peroxide in one liter or one bottle of that stuff. So let's figure out the molecular weight of hydrogen peroxide. We've got two hydrogens at one apiece and two oxygens at 16 apiece for a total of 34 grams per mole. So now that we know the molecular weight of hydrogen peroxide and we know that there are 30 grams of the stuff in one bottle of that 3% solution, we should be able to figure out how many moles there are. Now here's the beauty thing, eh? Even if you knew absolutely nothing about chemistry, you could still solve this problem and get the right answer. And that's because you know the final answer has to be in moles. Now remember, anything you do to the numbers, you have to do to the units. So let's just ignore the numbers for a second and just play with the units. So let's just try some shit out here. Let's say we were to multiply the 34 grams per mole by the 30 gram. 
The final units would end up being grams squared over moles. Totally wrong. What if we divided grams per mole by grams? Well, then the grams cancel at least, but you're left with one over moles. Also wrong. However, if we divide grams by grams per mole, now the grams cancel and you're left with moles on the top. And because the units are right, you know your answer is right. Plugging in the numbers, we get 0.88 moles of hydrogen peroxide in 30 grams. Science trick number two, anytime you can use a ratio, do it. Our protocol calls for 2.5 moles of hydrogen peroxide in one liter, and we want that to be equal to 0.88 moles in some volume of water. Cross multiply and Bob's your uncle. 0.352 liters or 352 mils, which means we want to evaporate one liter of that 3% solution down to 352 mils, and we'll have our 2.5 molar solution. Now clean up all these Cheerios on the floor, kids, and get back to work. There's our one liter of hydrogen peroxide. We want to slowly evaporate that. You don't want to boil it because that can decompose some of the hydrogen peroxide and you won't end up with what you want. So you want to do it nice and slow. So we'll ease that down to 350 mils and that'll give us our 2.5 molar. There we go, 350 mils of 2.5 molar hydrogen peroxide right on the nose. Remember, read the meniscus. And you'll probably want to wear gloves when handling this. It's a pretty good oxidizer. All right, here are my samples. Uh, I've got some longitudinally cut pieces of, well, I don't know, pine or, it's off a two by four, so whatever the hell that is. And some radial cut specimens. If you think of a tree trunk as just a bunch of straws stuck together, and that's what the xylem and phloem are, big tubes that run up and down the tree. Uh, what you're doing when you cut radially like this is you're cutting the straws off at the top. This way, there are straw the straws, the openings of the straws are in this direction. Here, they're all exposed. So, that is part of the trick of getting to this to be transparent. You actually have a tube in there, very tiny tubes that you are exposing. So, I've got that, and I've got a big chunk here. Don't think this is going to work, but yeah, give it a shot, eh? Okay, let's put our delignification juice in the Pyrex pot. Oh, well. Let's give it lots of lots of potential there and throw our samples in. We want to prevent as much evaporation as we can, so we'll lid it. And since I can stir, I think I'll just toss that in there. Now this is going to take at least 12 hours, so grab yourself a lawn chair and a cooler full of beer. So I've just brought it up to a gentle simmer, maybe a little bit more. I just want it just simmering. And every once in a while, I'm going to come and give him a flip. And you can see it's only been like 15 minutes and already we've got a lovely urine shade. Three hours later. We're seven hours in and we're at the night of heavy drinking, zero water intake stage. Flipping every, mm, I don't know, hour or so. Since we're at the halfway mark, I thought it might be prudent to swap out our old lignin juice for some fresh stuff. Look, it's actually stained the pot. That's where that comes from. Well, scummed the pot, rather. Hopefully I need enough. Oh yeah, we're good. All right, our 12 hours is up, but it's too late to be dicking around with this now, so I'm just gonna put it in water and we'll deal with the rest tomorrow. Now the protocol states, ye shall rinse said delignified samples in boiling water, not once, not twice, but thrice. So here we go. All right, those samples now should be thoroughly clean. Let the oxidizing begin. This is where we're going to use our hydrogen peroxide solution. And we're going to boil it in there. So our samples will go in and they should start bubbling. The protocol says not to stir, so we won't do that. And uh, we're supposed to wait until the yellow color disappears. Okay, whatever you say, we'll give it a go. Here's what they're looking like at time zero. After about only five minutes, the samples are lightening up quite a bit. Looks to me like they're all trying to get out. 
Well, you're not going anywhere, fuckers. You're in for the long haul. About an hour and a half in, things are definitely lightening up, although, I don't know. I have a hard time believing that yellow color is going to disappear. Time will tell. We're about seven hours in now, and I'm not really sure we're getting any more lightning out of this. Uh, I have been topping this up with just uh, 3% as it evaporates, just to keep the volume up. I think maybe we'll just let it run overnight, and that's got to be enough, I would think. Well, I kind of fucked up here. Uh, it's been more than maybe 18 hours in this stuff. I left it overnight, and that was a bad idea, I guess, because... Some of my samples are disintegrating. Oh, fucking no. So, uh, I'll try and salvage what we can here. So, some of the thinner pieces really did break apart. And the longitudinal sections aren't... Oh, damn. So terrible. Even the longitudinal sections are very brittle so damn it now my big chunk has some structure left to it but uh, yeah not transparent at all let's see if I can pick up one of these we'll hold it up to the light so you can see yeah, yeah so it is translucent uh, I don't know. Not transparent by any means. I assume one of these little pieces... Let's see if I pick something up. Son of a bitch. Translucent, but... Still. And our big chunk. Oh, for fuck's sake. I can see how this might work, but uh, it didn't for me. Had I not left it so long, I don't know, we wouldn't got it any better. Anyway, so, so much for wait for the yellow to disappear. Alright, even though I totally screwed this up, uh, there is some salvageability from this. This is a longitudinal section. It is translucent and somewhat transparent, although it's not very spectacular. Thinner section, cut radially though, does a much better job of letting light through. That super thick one actually does a decent job too. So I can see that this would work if you did it properly, but there's something I'm missing because we never got the yellow out of these ones and uh, it didn't really go truly transparent. So I'm off somewhere, but uh, we're close. Now the last part of this protocol requires that you saturate all those little holes that are formed in here from the xylem and where you've uh, chewed away the lignans and saturate that with epoxy, which, yeah, would certainly strengthen it, but isn't the whole point to find something that is transparent and not made of plastic? <laughs> that would seem like the thing to me. Uh, so all this is doing is providing a scaffolding for the epoxy, really. I don't quite see the point. Now, I certainly didn't get results like this. <laughs> That's damn impressive. That is uh, epoxy impregnated. Well, I think I'll file this one under M for meh. Bit of a waste of time, but better me than you, right? Thanks for watching. Cheers.